Oh, okay. now it says that everybody's recording. Thank you, Susan. Okay, everybody, let's get started. This, this age of technology is just too much. All right, but well, we're here, and I love seeing so many of you, and some of you came so early, and I'm seeing a lot of names who I know are not friends. So first, let me thank the friends who are here because of you. We are able to have Shelly and have this fabulous program and have future programs, which I will tell you about shortly. And if you're not a friend, as I see so many wonderful new names, welcome all of you to us tonight. I hope you will enjoy um, Shelly's program. And um, please check us out at www.sterlingfriends.org, see what we're all about. And hopefully you will become a friend and join us on the many programs we will be having in future. We have a wonderful program lined up for the fall. Check your newsletters to everybody who friends who gets them every week. And it is very exciting. So starting in October, the lineup is amazing. Um, as far as the programs this week, check your newsletter and know that tomorrow night is Emmanuel Abramowitz's music program. And um, there will be a New Yorker on Wednesday. Shelley, um, Hannah said maybe not, but um, Jerry is filling in. So please, if you're part of the New Yorker, join us. And if you're not part of the New Yorker yet, join us and you will love it because we have such a nice time. Um, and then Monday at the library in person will, um, no, not this Monday. Uh, yeah, this coming will be, uh, um, Candy is doing Jungle Cruise and the short story on Tuesday in, in the library. Where are you? Is going and that's basically what's happening because we are transitioning. No, I didn't. Time programs. Time. Did you, did they did you have that you had that page? Wait a minute, please mute yourself. The number one, everybody, please go on mute. Oh, no, it says free. Barbara, please go on mute. Okay. Barbara. Yes. Please mute yourself. Oh, I'm not. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> things happen. Yes, please, everybody, go on mute, and um. What I was saying is we are transitioning. So the afternoon programs are in the library. The Zooms are evening in Zooms. So we're, we're trying to hit everybody and, and meet everybody's needs that way. Um, so without further ado, let me talk to you about Shelly. Oops, I think that's me. Um, so Shelly um, will be doing an amazing movie tonight, Bicycle Thieves, which um, is supposed to be the classic of classic of classic movies. And he's going to explain to us why this is. If anybody um, is new to Shelly, let me just tell you that he is amazing at facilitating foreign films and you are in for a major treat. For those of us who know Shelly well and want to know more about where he's lecturing, what his venues are, what his cruises are, to get on his newsletter. I will put his email in the chat and please check it out and get his information because what he does is amazing and we are so thrilled to have him. And Shelly, it's all yours. Okay. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm a little late. I've been having trouble with Zoom, as you can see. Okay, there we go. <laughs> well, welcome. Wow, nice crowd tonight. I see familiar faces too that I haven't seen in a while. Anyway, so this evening we are doing one of the great classics of all time, and justifiably so, The Bicycle Thieves. But before I get into the film itself, I want to do something that I haven't done with this group, uh, and I haven't hello and i haven't done in a while uh which is to clarify what i consider the basics for appreciating a film uh any film any great film uh and i call them 
Some of you are familiar with it. I call it the three R's, uh, resonance, relevance, and revelation. And I want to apply it to this particular film because this is a perfect example of all of that, uh, as well as the history of the film. When we talk about resonance, we're talking about the ability to evoke or suggest images, memories, and emotions. How a film does this for us. Uh, think of yourselves, we have to think of ourselves like tuning forks. Uh, tuning fork vibrates at a particular pitch when you strike it uh, against the hard surface. And it emits a tone that musicians, you know, if we know about music, musicians use the tone to tune their instruments. Well, we could think of ourselves in that way. And that when we watch a film, a scene, uh, we look, we hear dialogue and action can strike a chord within us, whereby we relate that moment to our own experience. Relevance, the quality closely connected in a film, it could mean how an event or a scene can connect to events in your own life, whether they relate to history, uh, social issues, religious issues, or political issues. Uh, films tend to do that for us. Movies affect us. Uh, many of us uh, powerfully because the combined impact of an image, of music, of dialogue, lighting, sound, special effects can elicit deep feelings and help us reflect on our own lives. Uh, we do that naturally. They can help us to better understand our own lives the lives of those around us, even how our society and culture operate. When a film remains non-political and non-controversial as possible, it risks becoming irrelevant. It risks becoming irrelevant. Uh, and that brings me to Revelation, uh, a surprising and previously unknown fact, especially one that is made known in a dramatic way. Uh, some of the most crucial scenes in cinema come when an important information is revealed to us. This key information can be learned at the same time the character does in a film. It can be real, revealed to us before the character finds out, or we may discover it after the character already knows it. Regardless of how we find out, a good revelation scene is not just about the moment when a twist or an idea occurs when things are revealed and surprises ensue, but also about what leads up to this scene, what brings us to a point in time. If characters are developed properly and the information is withheld until the right moment in the plot, you have revelation. Using these three R's, uh, relevance, resonance, and revelation, uh, I will discuss them within the context of Bicycle Thieves. As I said, considered one of the greatest films of all time. Produced in 1948, uh, Bicycle Thieves, or The Bicycle Thief as it became known in the US, was released at the height of what was known as neorealism. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with real, neorealism, and I bring it up constantly, it's a distinctly Italian film movement, uh, which arose right after the Second World War and was characterized by stories set amongst the poor and the working class, filmed on location, solely on location, frequently using non-professional actors. Italian neorealism films mostly contend with the difficult economic and moral conditions of post-World War II Italy, uh, representing changes in the Italian psyche and conditions of everyday life, including as I said, poverty, oppression, injustice, and desperation, and desperation. Uh, Vittorio De Sica, the director, had already established himself as a leading neorealist director with his previous film, Shoeshine. Shoeshine came out a year before Bicycle Thieves. Uh, it also it won a Special Academy Award in 1948. And then this film won a special honorary Academy Award in 1950. Academy Awards were not being given out yet for foreign language films. It wasn't until 1954 that they were given out. Uh, after making this film, he made another classic, Umberto D, which was considered the last formal neorealist film to be made. 
in Italy, the last formal neorealist film to be made. Uh, Vittorio De Sica created this particular masterpiece in 1948, uh, when post-war Rome was filled with hardship. The film was not released here until 1950. Uh, it is a relatively, as you've seen, simple tale of an unemployed family man, Ricci, who is fortunate enough to land a city job. The job, however, required him to have a bicycle, a bicyclette. During his first day on the job, the bicycle is stolen. And the rest of the movie deals with his struggle with his young son to track down the thief to reclaim his bike back so he can keep his job. Using his mastery as a director, De Sica involved us in this film emotionally, striking what I call our inner tuning forks to vibrate from the resonant, relevant, and revealing moments. Ultimately, we'll see how this film, reflecting another culture as well as another time, can be so universally relatable through the social, economic, and emotional conditions that prevailed at that time. Uh, there are so many key scenes in this movie, and I'd like to walk through them uh, again. In the first scene, when we're introduced to a world steeped in unemployment, as we see men waiting to, waiting to find jobs available for them, and our main character, Antonio Ricci, uh, relevance is immediately established. We can closely identify whether the evidence in our own life, as I said, events in, in the history of Italy, uh, what is relevant here is not just to what was happening in Italy just three years after the war, but we can relate to what is happening right now. Unemployment levels have not been this high uh, since, or, or were originally this high since the Great Depression. They've started to come down. Uh, inflation, has not been this high in for over 30 years. In the next scene, it is revealed that he really doesn't have the bike in his possession. Uh, and he lies and said, I'll have a bicycle tomorrow. And then he sees his wife, we see him meet Maria, we see Maria gathering water. Now, what's interesting is you look at the, the locale, these bright white buildings. This was part of Mussolini's dream to build these uh, during the late 30s and early 40s, but they weren't working. There was no running water. Uh, the women had to go outside to get the water. Uh, we see her with the other women gathering the water. He goes and he approaches her and he tells her he needs the bicycle. She looks at him. Uh, they he had pawned the bicycle so they can eat, so they can eat. And now uh, he says, what kind of man can I be? I can't work unless I have the bicycle. She goes upstairs without a word. She gathers up the sheets, her wedding present, her dowry. She gathers up the sheets. There is so much resonance in seeing how Antonio and Maria join an army of people like themselves as the camera. This is one of the, one of the key scenes in the movie. We see the camera follow the sheets up a wall where there are hundreds, maybe thousands of sheets like that. How many people have pawned their sheets representing the plight of so many in Italy? We can relate to them. This symbolic revelation, as well as when he will get his bicycle also plucked from so many hundreds of bikes sitting there in that room. The Seeker continues to bring us so much closer to the fabric of life in Italy at this point uh, and, the, and the plight of the poor. After Ricci has succeeded in securing his job, the first morning of work brings joy to the family. We are introduced to his son, Bruno. That kid is so cute. I couldn't get, you, you can't get over that face, that face. It just stays with you. I mean, the Seeker, as I said, the seeker used all non-professional actors and was known to walk the streets of cities throughout Italy, looking first for a face. First, he would look at a face. If he liked a face, he would walk up to them and say, how would you like to be in a movie? Well, he did the same thing with Bruno and his family. How would you like your son to be in a movie? 
And he's an adorable little man in that, that outfit he puts on like his father. Uh, and his actions resonate with us, drawing our empathy, drawing us more and more into this film, as do Antonio's playfulness with Maria. Notice on that first day, she makes him this sandwich. He's hugging her. He's playing around. She says, what are you doing? Uh, we see a family. We see a family. And, and Bruno looking after the baby, you know, he closes the shutters. He doesn't want he doesn't want the noise. He doesn't want the sun bothering the baby. Scenes that resonate with feeling and are filled with relevance and reveal moments of true familial love and caring at that moment. Antonio and Bruno are off to work, the little man and the big man. Bruno to his job at the gas station. Uh, in those days, kids had to work. They had to work. And Antonio joining an army of men just like him. Here we hear the music, the swelling, the uplifting of music. We see all these men with ladders on bicycles riding to work, riding to work. The close-ups of cheerful faces, the shots of the workday beginning, all done. On, it's a symphony. This is the seeker creates a symphony of humanity, all done on real streets with real people. A scene filled with resonance and relevant qualities, a realism that again brings us so close to the fabric of real life in Italy at that moment. As the film progresses, Antonio has been taught what to do and is now on his own. Here, the darker aspects of the story are set in motion. Up to this point, we've only seen people who want to help Antonio, a family feeling a change for the better, but a new revelation is about to take hold. A new revel, and notice what he's papering up. Uh, it's it's the poster of Rita Hayworth. It's a Hollywood poster that he's putting up. These people can't even afford to go to the movies, and he's putting up a poster of Rita Hayworth of Hollywood on the streets. Uh, it's such contrast that the seeker creates. It's all intentional. All intentional. It's also a lean towards movies. Uh, and then along come the men who will steal his bicycle. Running after the thief, he fails to catch up to him. He loses him. And Antonio's loss becomes our own. Antonio's loss becomes our own. From here, he tries to enlist the help of the police. They can't help. They can't help. He turns to his neighbors. When down in the caves of the basement, we are exposed to a communalism of people sharing their politics, their art, they're doing a play, and they agree to help him search for his bicycle. And, and on the next day, he and Bruno will go on an odyssey through the streets of Rome. Uh, his friend takes the, the water truck, I love it, they go in, they encounter a market revealing thousands of bicycles. God, know many, God knows how many bicycles must have been stolen. Many of them probably stolen and dissembled for their parts. From the looks on their faces, we as, they, as, as, we, as well as they sense that this will become a futile endeavor. And here the seeker introduces another moment of societal discord. Bruno is confront, confronted by a predator. Bruno is confronted by a predator. The man, you know, is offering to buy him something. And we fear for him at that moment. You know, he could disappear in an instant. And fortunately, uh, Ricci shows up. Antonio finds him. As the story progresses, Antonio and Bruno continue their journey alone. After a rainstorm, uh, and we see them huddled against the wall with the with the church, with the with the priest walking by, speaking German, and they have no idea what's going on. And uh, little Bruno's looking, and Antonio sees the thief as the rain stops. He chases after him again to no avail, but they track down his accomplice, encountering him at a church service for the poor. Uh, he eludes them. And while searching, Antonio slaps. If you remember, as they lose him, Antonio slaps Bruno when he tells him, you let the old man get away. 
he slaps him. He admonishes Bruno for telling him to, and tells him to wait by the bridge. He says, you're a little troublemaker. And, and Bruno is so upset. You could feel his upset, the look in his eyes. This kid never acted before. Uh, and he turns it on for us. Uh, the seeker cleverly contrasts Antonio's harshness at that moment with Bruno. And he suddenly he is screaming that a boy is drowning. And he runs down to the water thinking, fearing it's Bruno. How he contrasts one minute, he's yelling at him. The next minute, oh my God, my son is dead. And thankfully he realizes Bruno did what he was told. He sees him sitting up on the steps. Don't you love that little move Bruno makes when he takes off his coat, he folds it over and he sits down like a little gentleman. Uh, I mean, it's the touches in this film are wonderful. That's what I call resonance. Uh, he did what he was told. And now Antonio realizing the futility of the search as they walk on the street. And he says to Bruno, he's trying to make up to him. He asks him about the soccer team when the truck rolls by and Bruno is tired and hungry. And he says, how about if we go to lunch? We'll get a pizza. We'll get a pizza. I'm never going to find that bike anyway. And, and they go into that restaurant. There's a guy playing music. They sit at the table and he orders a, a bottle, a full bottle of wine and the, the mozzarella sandwiches. And he looks at Bruno and he says to him, your mother, your mother would laugh if she saw you be pouring. I wonder what she would think if she saw me giving you wine. Uh, and they're enjoying it. And he's looking over at the table. And here again is a key moment. He looks across and is a, a well-to-do, what looks like a well-to-do family sitting there. And the little boy is eating and he's cutting his food with a knife and fork. Bruno can hardly handle the knife and fork as he tries to cut into the sandwich and he can't. Uh, again, you know, staring at that boy. And then Antonio makes an off remark and, and, and looks at the food like, what am I doing? You know, we can't afford, and Bruno stops eating. He says, no, eat, eat, enjoy it, enjoy it. And he decides, you know, at that moment, he's, he says, I wonder how much I could have been earning. And he starts to figure, but he can't figure it. He gives it to Bruno. He says, you calculate. He gives him the pencil and he's giving him the figures. And Bruno is smart and he's figuring it. And, but in the end, he knows they won't find that bicycle. That money is gone. They revisit and they go and they revisit. If you remember the scene near the beginning when Maria goes to visit the, the sainted woman, now they go and visit. You know, Antonio thought it was pure nonsense. Uh, and by the way, when we saw that scene at the beginning, you know, he goes upstairs and tells his kids, well, watch my bike. It could have disappeared at that moment, but it didn't. It didn't. But they revisit the sainted woman who Antonio mocked. And, and now he's desperate for her to give him hope. He whispers into her ear about the bicycle. And her message is a bleak one. If you don't get it right away, you'll never get it. Uh, and the seeker reveals at that moment how these people put their hope into a false and archaic faith, into a false and archaic faith. Uh, a tradition which is, you know, false. Uh, I mean, I love it before she sees Antonio, she sees that guy and she's, you know, you're really ugly. Give up that other girl and <laughs> get out of here. Uh, and suddenly now they go down and they spot the thief. They spot the thief of all people. And he enters a brothel. He enters a brothel, a house of Rome the first house of Rome uh, and, and they try to keep him out and Bruno has to wait outside and he comes in and he fights, the women are trying and he fights with the, the thief says, I don't know who you are. And then finally he gets him outside and he's confronted by the mob. There's even the inference at that point, at that point of mafiosi coming to the aid of the thief, the guy with the sunglasses, you get the feeling the gangsters are here. Uh, and they, they, Bruno slips away at that moment and he brings back the cop. He gets the cop and they, they search the apartment and the mother is going on and he's pretending to have a seizure 
And uh, she says, there's nothing here. And then they find, you know, Bruno uncovers the tires against the wall. Oh yeah, they're my brothers. He sold his car. He sold his car. Uh, finally, he's asked if he wants to press charges and Antonio realizes what he's up against. And he and Bruno just leave, but the mob still chases them down the street. Uh, and here we come to the climactic scene in the film. After having gone through this odyssey, after having gone through this search with Ricci and his son, we see an angry and desperate Antonio. They're, they're across the street from the soccer match. What is he looking at? Again, a sea of bicycles, a sea of bicycles. He looks around the corner. There's one lone bicycle against the wall. We see him looking. He's desperate. He looks at Bruno. And in, a, in an extremely well-edited scene, we realize what he's about to do. And Bruno, he gives Bruno money. He says, here, take the streetcar home. He sees the sea of bicycles. He spies the bicycle again alone. We can sense what's on his mind as he watches the crowd leaving the stadium with the music building up, the tension mounts. We almost want to cry out to him, don't do it. Don't become a thief. Don't become a thief. But the question is, are we going to hate him for it? Are we going to hate him for what he's about to do? Not at all. We're sad for him, knowing what has driven him to this act of desperation. And it is in this moment that the seeker wants us to understand life. Don't blame people for their behavior unless you first understand what has driven them to behave as they do until you understand their motivation. Huge complex forces are at work here at that moment. Social forces have driven these people into poverty. War has driven these people into poverty. If we think back to the scene where they pawn the family linen and the clerk putting that bundle on the shelf, uh, they are not the only ones so afflicted that they have to pawn the family sheets. They are not just among the few. They are one of countless numbers of the impoverished. That's what he wants to show Italy. That's what he's showing the world. Fortunately, because Bruno is there, the owner of the bike decides not to press charges and Ricci is set free. The owner looks at the little boy and he looks at Ricci and he's aware how desperate the father must have been uh, and he forgives Antonio. Ricci and Bruno walk off in utter despair. He holds Bruno by the hand. Ricci begins to cry as they walk off. The movie will end at that moment. Of course, you don't want it to end there. You would rather he got back, he got his bike back. You want a happy Hollywood ending. But real life does not have happy endings. And this is 1948. For the impoverished, if you want more happy endings, the seeker is saying, then you are going to have to help create a more just society, a society where every man willing to work has a decent job, a society that will allow workers to have dignity and provide basic support systems to ensure the stability of the family. If you want a happy ending, then stop wishing for one and start doing something to make this a better world. That's what he was saying in 1948. And that message still holds today. Though, through the bicycle thief, you have seen how those three R's that I spoke about, re resonance, relevance, and revelation, can be basic to involving us in a story, and how a director can use them to great effect in telling stories that reflect our world as it is, making us empathize, and in some cases, consider how we can affect change. I often say, the films don't change the world, but they will change how we see the world. They will change how we see the world. And after seeing The Bicycle Thieves, the eminent playwright, Arthur Miller, was moved to write, The Bicycle Thief is every man's search for dignity. It is as though the soul of a man had been filmed. The film is unafraid to examine openly, straightforwardly, the terrible, distorted, destructive world which man has made for himself. 
His search for his stolen bicycle assumed shimmering proportions of symbolism. And we are lifted out of realisms by realism itself into a world of simple comparisons. For instance, are we not all in search for our own dignity? And does this not come to us by means of our work, which is our justification and our basic worth? This man's work has been stolen from him and the city of his home turns into a jungle around him and he has nothing, nothing at all. This picture, perhaps above all others, performs the central function of art without warping the life it depicts. It discovers the meaning of a life and its significance for the entire human race. Clearly, clearly, The Bicycle Thieves is a film worth revisiting as it serves not only to reflect its own time, but each time you see it. You too, have, you too change with time. You know more than you did before. You're more mature. You're experienced more of life. At whatever, at whatever age you were the first time you've seen this movie, you will be different every time you see it after. And when you see a film a second, third, or more times, you'll appreciate how it resonates, how its relevance and revelation will add to your understanding and your appreciation. And that's what this film does. Uh, the, the screenplay writer, I have to tell you, uh, Cesare Zavattini, uh, who wrote the three great films that the Sika made in a row, Shoeshine, Bicycle Thieves, and uh, Berto D., Uh, was a communist. And you can see how he is advancing the idea of socialism in this film, uh, of trying to find, you know, showing an unequal world, a desperate world that is created because of inequality. Uh, and, and as I said, all the actors in this were real people. They were people he found on the street. And uh, um, Uh, Lamb Lamberto, Lamberto Maggiorani uh, did go on after this film uh, to play other parts. He had a short career. Uh, Bruno Enzo Staiola acted up till 1977. He is still alive. Uh, he's still around. Uh, you know, he's in his 80s. He's still around. He doesn't. He hasn't acted since the since the 70s. He retired, so to speak. Uh, and went to work. <laughs> uh, Leonella Carell playing Maria. She uh, she also launched an acting career with this film. The only actor in the film was uh, a gentleman by the name Gino Saltamarenda. Uh, he played Bioko. He played the heavy set fella that ha helps him on his quest. He was the only actor in the film. And he died only uh, two years after the making of the film. But he had been acting in silent film uh, long before that. Uh, so you have that. And by the way, I have to tell you, give you a little genesis of the film. Uh, when the Seeker was making it, he was looking for funding. And Warner Brothers, uh, somebody at Warner Brothers had seen the script. And they said to him, Uh, if, if you want more money to make the film and we'll help you make it, we'll give you film, we'll, we'll even build sets for you. Uh, they said, you have to do one thing. And at first, they wanted Cary Grant to star in the movie. They wanted to get Cary Grant to star in the movie. And DeSica said no. And then they wanted Henry Fonda to star in the movie because of Fonda's role in The Grapes of Wrath. They thought this would be a great, great thing for him. And DeSica said, there's no way I'm going to use a star in this movie. And he wound up turning them down. Thankfully, thankfully, he wound up turning them down. And, and Bicycle Thieves became the film it did. Uh, fortunately, uh, it would have had a Hollywood ending. And fortunately, it didn't. Uh, so there you have a little genesis of the film. And now I'd like to open it up for conversation. Uh, let me dig in. I see a hand up right away. Jim, jump right in there. Hello, Shelley. How are you? Good. How are you? <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, uh, just uh, two observations. One, there was a um, kind of a pristine quality to the way the 
film was uh, produced in that there weren't a lot of glitzy objects to distract you. It was kept simplistic. It wasn't uh, uh, embellished so that the focus could remain on the characters and their emotions. And there wasn't a lot of ambient interest in what was going on outside of the action. Uh, right. Additionally, I thought there was an interesting relationship between Antonio as a father towards Bruno, that uh, at some times there was almost complete indifference. And it seemed to me that as his uh, sense of self manhood deteriorated, mm -hmm. he abandoned his responsibility as a father equally that uh, he couldn't even be a real father without having been a real man. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 well, it, it is a total deterioration because he's, he's so becomes so self-obsessed right. with finding the thief uh, and getting his bicycle because that bicycle to him means life that he gives up everything else. This is what he's reduced to. This is what people are reduced to. And, and uh, you know, and I, I love your comment about the simplicity of the film. And, and I didn't go over at the beginning and you, you sort of opened that up for me is the, the tenets or the basic principles behind neorealism was the fact that they had to be shot on location because there were no sets available in Italy. Uh, it was hard to get film. Uh, they had to gather scraps uh, of, of film, ends of film uh, and put them together to be able to shoot these films uh as i said you know non-professional actors there was no lighting there was no other lighting except natural lighting in the film uh and and this, so it, it is bare bones i mean they were real wearing their own clothes uh and you could see the clothes that they were wearing uh i mean one even makes a comment if you remember when he when he's catching the thief he's wearing a german cap if you remember, he makes a point that I'm wearing, I, my cap is German, I don't have anything. And somebody else makes the same comment. Uh, the, only, the only one in the film that seems to have, or two that seem to have anything are the family eating in the restaurant and the mafiosi that comes to the aid of the thief. He's wearing the sunglasses, he's dressed in a suit. I mean, that's the only, and, and the policeman, that's the only time you see a clean outfit in the film. Uh, it's very interesting how he portrays uh, society in this film, especially at that marketplace where everything is reduced to pieces. Everything is reduced to pieces of bicycles. Everything is deconstructed. Uh, and society, it's almost a symbol for the fact that society itself is becoming deconstructed. So thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, Paula. Hi. Um I want to kind of piggyback on what Jim said. I got right. carried away with the neglect of the child. I was <laughs> focusing too much on, on that. And I really think I missed the deeper meaning because I kept coming back to how he was treating the kid. And the kid was only dying to please his father. And so that really uh, upset me a lot. That's no, that's that's a great comment. You did you you almost became misdirected because and, and it's almost intentionally so. It's like, what are you doing? You're ignoring your son. Uh, and and you know, this is not the time to do that, yet we see what he's reduced to because right. of what he's lost. That's that's part of the message of the film, is yeah. is we are looking into this man's soul and, and it's becoming darker and darker as a result of what happens. Uh, it's a byproduct. It's a byproduct. And then he hits him. When he hits him, it was oh, like- Oh God, that's- Horrible, that. horrible. Yes, it was, it was, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, Paula. Linda, Tabor. Yeah, you know, you expect that bike to be stolen, but when it was stolen, my heart just sunk. I mean, he brings you in so emotionally. And the other thing is, there were, there were scenes that I almost felt they were going back to the non-talky movies. Everything was done by, um, de you know, demonstration of their hands, their faces, no, no uh, dialogue. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, it is, it is. you know, as I often say, you know, I, I don't mean it the wholeheartedly, but dialogue is the enemy of cinema. You know, we're looking at visual images and and they it is their actions. It is who they are. I mean, you know, when they're chasing the old man, when they're in the church, you know, a lot of these scenes didn't really require much dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, and don't forget, these people can't learn pages of dialogue. Uh, <laughs> they weren't they weren't trained to to memorize dialogue. So it had to be kept very simple, very simple. Uh, but that's great. That's it. great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lynn Zussman. I, I, I saw the movie and it was something. The scenes with all the bicycles were just fantastic. I mean, you'd think that that was staged or not. All those bicycles. And in fact, there were cars. And in one scene, there was a horse-drawn carriage. You know, such a time that I don't know. But my question is, when the film ended, I went, you know, and you know, you sit and you think about it, and I guess that is the right ending. I'm wondering if we all voted, would people have liked that ending, or would we have liked a happy ending? You know, that's the Hollywood. <laughs> you, you know, and I, I think about that. It had to end that way. I, I understand that, but I, yeah, he was a family man. He, the the relationship with his child was very, very interesting to me too. But he loved his wife. He wanted good and. It's, and I understand the social context that it was all in, which I thought was fabulous. No doubt. Yeah, that's it. exactly, exactly. I mean, and that's why that ending is the way it is, because it's, it's, you know, it is a twofold ending. I mean, you're getting, you know, yes, he's lost his bicycle, but he walks off in a sea of humanity and he's holding his son's hand. Yes. He's holding his son's hand. We are walking off into this together. You know, we'll find a way. But the son held his father's hand first because they were walking. And I yes. kept saying, why doesn't the father take? I was almost, you know, I don't want to say I was almost in tears, but I was almost in tears. And the son grabs the father's hand. But that was Italy in the 1940s, maybe, you know. I, 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 I. No, it's, it's the child, you know, the child is father to the man. But he is the hope of the future. Right, right. He is and, the hope of the future. The father is consumed and, with his loss of not being able to provide, which is a horrible situation. Right. I mean, that's exactly, exactly. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Susan Hurst. I, I had, there were two things that struck me in this movie. I really loved the movie too. The two things were how active those, the guy and his little boy were. They were running all over the place, the whole movie. I don't know. They used, I think they had more stamina back then than we have today. <laughs> and the other thing is the man's suit. It was so worn out. There was no nothing left to that suit. It was like draperies or something. I thought that suit is worn out. <laughs> so those were the two things I noticed. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> it's it's you're noticing the poverty. You know, you see, look at Bruno. I mean, he was held together by little rope. Uh, I mean, it was just it was just you know, and he had scenes in the film of such humanity to remind us that they, they're human. And, and, you know, when Bruno has to go to the bathroom, he's, he's going against the wall <laughs> and, and, and Antonio yells out, Bruno, and he jumps <laughs> and turns around. You know, I don't even have time for this. And he has to run, <laughs> uh, the poor kid. Uh, you know, we, we see all of these little moments of humanity in the film at the church, you know, and the church, is all they're interested, all they're interested in is what they're doing. You know, Antonio is trying to get this guy to, 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 to admit, you know, who he is. And, they're, you know, they're, you know, he's walking in the middle of what's going on here. And we see these rich people who are getting them to sing and feeding them. Uh, this is what was going on. This was, you know, Italy at that time. He was really captured. By the way, you know, uh, neorealism fell out of favor as I said, in, in around 1954 with Umberto D, because the Italian people, now this was the beginning of what they called the, the Italian economic miracle. It was starting to rebuild. And the Italian people did not want to see these films anymore. They said, I don't want to see the poverty. I don't want to see who I am anymore. I want to see happier things. Uh, and they turned away from it. Yet, if you look at film from then on, 
uh, especially I, I, and some of you have seen it with me, Iranian film, you look at uh, film from around the world, you'll see the influence of neorealism uh, of what De Sica was doing, what Rossellini was doing. You'll see it in today's films, uh, in many of today's films uh, from around the world. Uh, you know, it's not a Hollywood invention. It's, a, it's an invention of realism. Uh, and uh, I think it's very, a very important movement in film. Uh, it's a challenging one. Uh, Susan Metz. Um, I wanted to comment on the fact that when uh, he has his job, first of all, Bruno was the only one working in the family. He was working at the gas station. Right. And when they, in the morning, when the mother was making the lunch, she made a bigger lunch for the father and a smaller lunch for Bruno. And that Bruno was getting dressed in his coveralls, just like his father to be just like him. That was the first thing I noticed that there was a, a certain pride in being like your father. And then at the end, it was sort of like coming full circle. He's, he sees that bicycle there all alone. And he, he wants the bicycle so badly that he, he just becomes the thief himself. And it was a, a whole turn of reversal of roles in a way. So that was very, very moving. And uh, the fact that, you know, the son uh, stood by him no matter what, that was, that was also the fact that I saw. But it was a very moving movie. I don't like to say moving movie, but that was it. Yeah. The minute you got into it, the gray and the grit and the dust and, and the, the look of sadness, it was just a sadness about it. And um, just how the wife was willing to give up everything, something that was so important to her to, to give him some something, uh, get him a job and help him get, keep the job. It was really very, just the intertwining of everything was, was marvelous. Terrific. Yeah, it's, it's about human dignity. I mean, it is, you know, he, he was, you know, it, it is, it is so relevant. It couldn't be more relevant in whatever age you see this movie. Uh, if you really dig into it, it is, it is relevant at any time. Uh, you know, whether, whether this, this could be in India, this could be here in the United States, this could be in any country because we all have the capacity to become bicycle thieves. We all have the capacity to become bicycle thieves. Uh, and this is what he's saying. And you know, if, 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 if we don't pay attention, if we don't care for each other, if we don't, if we look away, then things can get bad and we see it happening. <laughs> we see it happening. I don't wanna get political, but you know, we see these things happening every day in this country. Uh, it's, it's a sad situation. Thank you, Susan. Dreja. Crap to mute. Okay, there so they're seeing a movie and then they're seeing a movie with Shelly and they're two totally <laughs> different experiences. <laughs> okay, so, well, yes. Um, so, I, you know, I, I I started watching the movie and then I like with at, just after the first couple of minutes, um, I stopped it and, and I Googled to see when the movie was made. Okay, because, you know, I, I didn't know whether it was something that modern day that was made to look old or just what it was. So as soon as I saw that, that it went back, I said, oh, this is right after the war. So that helped to create a context for me as far as watching a movie, as far as a context. What you did at the beginning with really your explanation of what neo neo realism neo -re with about neo realism um, and and the the whole thing and then going into the the um, uh, again the richness of how the movie was made which is what you do so beautifully you know the fact that they that they weren't actors. Um, it just took it to a completely different level. Yes, when when it ended, just as somebody else said before, I said, what, <laughs> <You know>? what? <laughs> but it really was perfect. I mean, as, as much as I didn't like it, I mean, you also used a word at the beginning and that was desperation. And that was, that for me, that was the, the overriding emotion in watching the movie was, was just desperation, you know, with, with just 
essentially all of the characters that, that, that they were living lives of desperation. So once again, I want to thank you for taking a good experience and making it so rich and so deep. So thank you, Shelley. Thank you. Thank you, Dredge. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm glad you got so much out of it. Uh, uh, Marilyn, you got your hand up. <laughs> um, there were two things that, uh, that I wanted to comment on. Number one, the contra another place where I saw contrast was the home that Bruno and, and you know, Richie, the Richie home was very, very sparse and Spartan. And then they showed that the seer, the, the woman who they went to for yes. um, advice and for her insight, there was a huge contrast I saw between those two homes also. And the other thing that I, to me also, I saw this as what could happen to a very moral man. I mean, when we saw him at the beginning, I mean, his morals, his integrity was way up there. And, and then you place him in a situation where the economy and the social circumstances, we show him as like so beaten down that his, he can handle the environment and he has to compromise his morality, I thought. And until we walk in his shoes, I mean, we have to really understand it. But there but for the grace of God go I, anybody, if you're beaten down that way, you know, we could follow that same way. Anyway, that's it. Great. No, no, the, your, your discussion of contrast is, is so right on. Uh, it's terrific. Uh, something happened to my screen. I can't see. Too. Yeah, did some, some other screen? Yeah, it was, something happened to I guess the I was screen. Trying to mine as well. Mine yes. Yeah, I'm enjoying the conversation. <laughs> how, do we, how do we do that? Shelly, can know. I ask a question about that seer? In the books that I'm reading lately and in a few of the movies, I'm noticing yes. the importance of these people that we would call today maybe fortune tellers, maybe not. Um, how are they paid? I mean, here's a, a destitute family uh, going to this person who has that lovely house. Donations. Uh, I'm, I'm hey, sorry. I yeah, I, they, they, I'm having trouble here. I don't know I what, what happened. Also, I am too. I can't. See somebody, it. somebody came into the Zoom. Oh, it's, Anne, it's Ann Lee Weiner's screen. She's yes, apparently she trying to. That. Yeah, yeah she that's to what I'm getting as here. well. Somebody did this. I have a Zoom <laughs> screen. Me too. Somebody on screen share. Is is yeah? It's yeah, on Zoom. I, that's what it looks like. It's a screen okay, share. Screen share. Right, she's got a screen share. Now you go. Oh, oh, okay. Yay. Oh, okay. Yay. <laughs> Thank goodness. Okay, Linda, let me readdress. Go ahead. Just that you were asking about who was making the well, money. This, yeah. The and not only that, the importance. It's a it's a business that I'm finding in a lot of it's, books now. Yeah, and 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 it's it's the whole idea here is you know they're putting their faith not so much in God, and that's a contrast with the church, I, but in a false God. <laughs> they're, putting, they're putting their faith in a false God. This woman has the ability to tell you, you know, to see and tell you what she sees. And, and uh, you know, she doesn't even touch the money. If you remember, Bruno takes the money to give to her and she just goes like this, you know, she did give it to her, the person next to her. I mean, it's a whole ritual. It's a whole con game. Uh, that these people fall prey to. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that, that's, you know, they're giving their few cents that they have in their pocket right. to this woman, right. to this woman, because they think it's a desperate act. Mm -hmm. It is a desperate act, is basically what, what the Sikh is showing us, how desperate these people are to find a way out of this situation. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's that people will take advantage People will take advantage if you let them. And how often, as you said, you see in books, how often have we seen that in this country, uh, the kind games that go on? Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same thing. It's proportionate, but it's the same thing. Same thing. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jackie. I, 
I was just going to say two things. I, I don't see whether it was Hollywood or Cary Grant or anybody else, how the movie could have ended any differently. It was right after the war. It was right. horrible times. Um, if you watch anything or read anything about that time or any time like that, people are going to do what they have to do. And we all want to think we won't do it, but you're going to do what you have to do to protect your family. And I didn't think her selling the sheets or her gathering the sheets had nearly as much to do. I do think it had to do with his dignity, but it also had to do with the fact that if he had a job, he would be feeding the family. So, yes. I mean, it's easy to say she did it for his dignity. That makes her sound like such a wonderful person. And she is. But she also wanted to eat and feed her son. Oh, and yeah. To, no, 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 no question. Said, yeah. You're and right. to touch You're Marilyn's right. thing, too, I think that some of why the seer had better things is because, yes, people were paying her with money. But think about the time. They were probably paying her with anything they had if it was something in their possession. So I, I think so much of it fit in that we kind of want to we don't really understand well, you know, it, it's we do we do. I mean, it's it's if you look and you see, you know, you have to you have to be reminded because we're watching a movie, you know, we're watching a movie and things are going by, and that's why I say, you know, the first time the first time, uh, you know, you watch a movie, uh, and the second time you see it, the second time you see it. You have to be able to break it down. You have to be able to look and say, why is this, you know, if, if it's a good director, if, if it's a good film, a challenging film, you have to ask, why was that there? Why is that happening at that moment? What does it mean? What does it mean to me? What does it mean in the context of the film? And here, yes, he's showing all these desperate people sitting there waiting for an answer, uh, waiting for someone to provide that answer for them. And they're willing to give anything they have so that she'll give them the answer they want. Uh, and, and she doesn't give them necessarily the answer they want. As she says to him, if you don't get it now, you won't find it. You know, it's like, I'm not guilty. You know, I'm not gonna, you know, tell you you're gonna find the bike tomorrow, you know, uh, kind of thing. Uh, and he's left to go off on his own again. Uh, but yes, her, her getting the sheets out of hock is definitely, his, it's his ability to work. I'm giving you something that we can get the money so you can get the bike so you can go to work. I mean, she wants him to go to work. Uh, the dignity is the byproduct of it all. Uh, you know, it's but work gives us dignity. Work gives us the ability to love our child. Work gives us the ability to feed the family. I mean, all of it is, is at, especially at this moment in time in the film. But today, too, for a man to have work is important. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, there's a different attitude in Europe, uh, you know, in that society, people work to live here, people live to work, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a difference. A lot of people live to work. Uh, they're driven, they're driven. Whereas some people use their work so that they could live so that they could feed the family, they can enjoy their family and, and, and the like. But uh, yes, yes, it's all it's all part of it. It's all part of the bigness of the film, the universality of the film. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Jim? Yeah, there's a dynamic that uh, occurred to me during the conversations. When we watch the first thief explore the situation, kind of assess the scene, you know, scope it out, serendipitously kind of walk back and forth where he had his partner there doing it mm. and, and then stealing the bike. His goal was to steal the bike because it, it meant money or transportation or whatever to him. But when Antonio, the second thief, is anticipating that whole issue, he has already gone through an intense uh, uh, state of desperation. He knows what happens when someone steals someone's bike and how they suffer and how important this item can be to them. You know, in their entire manhood is being at stake without a tool that's essential. And for him to cross that line is a completely different experience than the first thief who just wants to grab a bike because I think it'll be an easy shot. And so it, it, it speaks to uh, the level of desperation that Antonio would have to go through because he's, he's not a crook, he's not a thief, he's not a dishonest man. But for him to have gone through that experience and then cross that line, it, 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 it creates the drama to a, a heightened uh, extent. 
for that act to, to occur. That's, that's terrific. And, and not only that, now that you, we have to extend that for the thief, that's his livelihood. That's his job. His right. job is to steal. His uh -huh. job is to steal from others. It's to steal their livelihood. Uh, he, you know, he's that 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 thief. And for Antonio to be reduced to someone like that is terrible. Is it's awful when we think about it. And 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 uh, you know, yes, we look at the ending of the film. By the way, I think about uh, if if Jackie, if Hollywood were doing the film, there is another ending. The ending would have been for the guy, for the guy, for the guy that, that he steals the bike from to look at him and say, you look like you need a job. Let me help you out. I mean, that's that's how Hollywood would end the film. OK, and it would be so unrealistic because, first of all, the guy does say you stole my only possession. If you remember with all the with all the chaos that was going on, he stole everything I got. There was a comment from the man whose bike it was saying he stole my he stole what I what, all I have. So in essence, that was all Antonio had, uh, and they stole it. What it represents, what it represents. Uh, so it's it's all, but that's that is true. It's that he's reduced to that, you know, by someone who at the beginning paces back and forth because that's his job to case something and then steal it. And now Antonio is not so much casing as he's looking for the opportunity to steal the bike when nobody's looking. Because he's, nobody's looking. he's facing the moral dilemma. The thief is not involved with the moral no, dilemma. No, he has no moral dilemma. Antonio is yeah. confronted with the moral dilemma. Yeah, so it, it is the difference between, you know, a society that still has a moral thread or fabric and one that doesn't, and one that doesn't. Uh, anybody else? Anybody else out there? Ah, Barbara Tate. I'm sorry, I saw you before. Barbara, you have to unmute. It took me a minute. That's I okay. have never seen this movie before. And I, I'm a person who has a list of the 100 best movies of all time in my, and I, and I go through it. And I was so excited to see it. And I just wanted to say, I liked everything about it, but the scene that was the most horrifying to me was when the woman sold the linens and they stacked the linens oh. in that. Uh, I was like, oh my God. But I was so pleased to finally seen the movie and I enjoyed it so much that when the end came and it said Fine, I read it as fine. <laughs> And I'm like, it is. It was just fine. And then I said, oh, God, it's the end. <laughs> Terrific. Well, I, you know, it's funny you mentioned the hundred in, in nineteen in in nineteen fifty. I think it was nineteen fifty two. They began the uh, the the British uh, Sight and Sound, uh, the British Film Association, Film Society. Uh, began a world poll, and it was to choose among directors would vote and pick uh, what they considered the best film of all time up to that time. And The Bicycle Thieves was picked as the greatest film of all time in 1952. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it just, and that's, that's why I'm still surprised that, that people haven't seen it. And I am glad I got some of you to see this. Oh, yeah. uh, I can't believe I haven't seen it. Until yeah, now. it's, 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 uh, and it, it's worth going back to from time to time to remind us, uh, to remind us uh, of, of what film can be. Uh, of what film should be, what cinema should be. I'm not saying it shouldn't be funny at times, it shouldn't be this, but this reminds us of, of the art of cinema uh, because it is art. This is pure art. Um, I have something in the chat, oh, Rocco and his brothers. Yeah, somebody's reminding me in the chat uh, of, of an Italian film which is available called Rocco and his brothers. Uh, you can see that people are reminding me of film, recommending film for us to see. Uh, 
So, oh, oh, somebody saw the confirmation on HBO or in Prime, which is broadly reminiscent of this one about a father down on his luck, uh, I think a British film. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting uh, what you will get out of this and how you can reference films. There was a Chinese film, by the way, made about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, called The Bicycle Thief. And it is Chinese and it's about a young man who is, uh, he, he has a bicycle and he delivers food and he's beaten up by a gang and they steal his bicycle. And it is uh, his journey, his odyssey to get back his bicycle. And that ends quite differently. Uh, so, so I will tell you that if you look for it. Uh, anybody else while we're sitting here, does anybody else have anything they'd like to add? Uh, well, I hope you enjoyed the film. I hope you enjoyed this little conversation. Uh, yeah. Oh, the confirmation is not a British film. It's an American film. I am sorry. I apologize. Uh, anyway, next next month, uh, in September, in two weeks, it's our last film. It's entitled English of English. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful film. As I, as I like to, in a session, end on a high note. And this one will be your high note. Uh, it's a wonderful story uh, of a quiet, sweet-tempered woman, uh, a housewife in India who uh, endures the small slights and stings from her well-educated husband and daughter because of her inability to speak and understand English. Uh, while visiting her sister in Manhattan, the, the film shifts from uh, from India to Manhattan. And while in Manhattan, she undergoes a series of events and forms newfound relationships that will transform her in the eyes of her family and the world. Uh, it's a wonderful story. Uh, and I will, I will give you more background on that when I see you in two weeks. Right. Uh, it's coming so, up September 12th. Well, three weeks. Uh, you can yeah. see it. You can, you can see it on Canopy. Uh, I think it's also available on Amazon. I will tell you. By the way, uh, just for those of you who are interested, if you ever want to know where a film is streaming or where it's available, there is a, a website you can go to on your computer, on your phone. It's, it's called Just Watch. Put the two words together, justwatch.com. Yeah. Justwatch.com. Uh, and if you go to that, you will find where any phone you type in the search, it'll tell you where it's streaming, where it's available. It'll even tell you if you have to rent it, how much to rent it for, uh, where it's the cheapest or where it's free. Uh, so uh, I, er it's okay. It's okay, Paula. English, Vinglish. English, Vinglish. Paula, oh, it's in the newsletter. It's in the newsletter. Yeah, it'll, yeah. it's in, and I will send out an email before, Thank so uh, to prepare you. you all. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paula. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Shelly. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks, Shelly. Thank Susan, you. you stop the recording. Good evening. Susan? Wow. Hey, Stan, I see you. <laughs>